Hi everybody, welcome to week three of um, data analytics. Today we're going to be looking at data pre-processing. So the outline of the talk for today is first we're going to just do an overview of some of the data pre-processing and data preparation techniques and how it fits into the scope of what we're doing in the subject. We're going to look at data integration which is merging data sets and some issues there. We're going to look at uh, smoothing of data of attributes. Uh, we're going to look at redundant attributes and what to do with them. We're going to look at normalization, which is all about scaling uh, numeric attributes. We'll look at data reduction, and we're going to, there's two, two areas there. One is reducing the number of data points, and the other is reducing the number of attributes. Then we're going to look at dividing the data into a number of smaller data sets. This is something we need to do in data mining and data analytics all the time. So it's really important that we do it correctly. And then finally, we'll look at some resampling techniques. So first off, uh, you've seen this diagram before. This is the knowledge discovery process. And what we're going to be looking at today, pre-processing, fits inside this uh, little red rectangle. So we're going to look at data selection, so selecting the attributes we're interested in, data pre-processing, and data transformation. But first off, why, why do we want to do this preparation? Well, usually a data mining study results in many different data mining tasks, and they're often interrelated with one another, and we often need to try different techniques for each of the tasks. So for example, in classification, we, want, we might want to use several different classification techniques. And um, each task might require different kinds of knowledge discovery. So just as an example, of um, a data mining task. Let's have a look at um, just a really simple example um, to do with movies. Just to remind you, these are an example of some of the data mining tasks that we have. So we've got classification, where we're trying to um, predict among a small number of discrete values. Uh, estimation, where we're trying to predict a real value. Characterization, where we're just trying to describe um, some data. Discrimination, we're trying to describe the difference between um, data. Clustering, we're just trying to group our data. Time series analysis, well, we're not going to look at that really today. So first off, let's have a look at an example of four tables. So we've got uh, a moviegoers table, which talks about the different moviegoers. So they have a name, a sex, an age. Um, we've got... Uh, the movies that they've seen, so past movies, so that has an ID, so for which movie go, which went to which movie. We've got a movies table, which just has the movie ID, the name of the movie, and the rating. And we've got sources, so that was where the movie go went to see, or where the, where the movie go lives. So here's an example of an SQL statement to extract some data from these tables. And we can see below here's our table that we've extracted. So we've got a whole lot of moviegoers, their gender, their age, um, where they live, and the movie that they went to see. So as an example of those tasks that we saw a few slides ago applied to the moviegoer database, we can see the following. So for example, in classification, we might want to determine the gender based on their age, the source, and the movies that the person's seen or we might want to determine the most recent movie based on the past movies. So here, gender, for example, is discrete. There's male or female, so there's only two things. Estimation expands that to a continuous variable. So for example, age. So we might want to estimate the age as a function of the, the source, where, they, where the movie goer lives, the gender, and the past movie goers that they've seen. If we had a rating field, then we might want to estimate the rating of uh, that a movie goer would give a movie. Uh, clustering. So here we're trying to find groups of movies that are often seen by the same people, or we might be trying to find groups of people that see the same movies. So we might be trying to break up our, our movies into... Ideally, we, would, we might see a, a breakdown of our movies in terms of maybe, maybe science fiction or action or drama, because people would might want to watch those movies together, or the same people might want to watch those movies. Uh, 
Next is affinity grouping. So here we use something called association rules, and here we're trying to find um, links, so when which movies are seen together. And we can see these as transactions. So for example, Amy might have seen Independence Day and Train Spotting. So we can think of this as a transaction. Andrew saw 12 monkeys, the birdcage, train spotting and phenomenon. And when we look at a transaction database like this, we can use association rule mining to find relationships. So for example, we might find things like if someone saw phenomenon and the birdcage, then they're likely to see train spotting. Or if they saw train spotting, they're likely to see Schindler's List. So we can find these rules. The first part, phenomenon and birdcage, is like the if part of the rule, and the last part, train spotting, is like the then part of the rule. So association rule mining is all about trying to find these kinds of rules. So why do we want to do data pre-processing? Well, in the real world, our data can be inconsistent, incomplete, and or noisy. And this can happen for several reasons. First off, there can be data entry problems, so people just essentially type things in incorrectly. There might be data transmission problems, so when the data is sent between different people or databases or companies, things can get lost in the process. Or there might be data collection problems, um, so someone simply might not have collected some of that data or they collected it incorrectly. There might be discrepancies in naming conventions. So for example, um, we might have some data where we have the we have the attribute date and some people might think that date means the the date the data was collected, other people might mean it was a, another date. So it has the same name but it's unclear what that means. Uh, we may have duplicated records, so particularly if we're integrating data from different sources, we may have a situation where we get um, the same person um, from two different data sets, and when we integrate it together, we've now got duplicate records. Um, incomplete data means we just have missing, missing information. Uh, contradictions in data just means that we have, um, in one place the data says one thing, and then in the other place the data says something else. We could think of that as noisy. So what happens when the data can't be trusted? Well, there's a common thing in computing called garbage in, garbage out, G-I-G-O, and that applies in data analytics just the same as in other kinds of computing. So if we have garbagey data going in, we might not get very good results. So it's, it's really important that we clean the data, that we get rid of all of the errors when we're making the, when we're doing the, the processing. So in terms of the data pre 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 preparation, there's sort of four areas. There's data cleaning, there's data integration, there's transformation, and there's reduction. So let's have a look at each of these four areas um, one by one. So first off, data cleaning. So as I was saying before, real-world application data can be incomplete, can be noisy, and it can be inconsistent. So for example, for some attributes, they may not be a recorded value. There may not be a data a value in the data set, or um, it might the data might not have been considered at the time of entry, so it's just not there. There might be random errors, or there may even be systematic errors where a systematic error has caused a whole lot of one attribute to be wrong in a, in a whole lot of ways. Or there might be irrelevant records, so data points that don't unimportant or there might be irrelevant attributes or fields, so attributes that aren't important. So data cleaning is trying to fix these things. So it's trying to fill in the missing values. Uh, it might be trying to smooth out the noisy data. Uh, it's going to try and correct the inconsistencies and, and we can try and remove the relevant irrelevant data. So the data that's not necessary for solving the problem. So first off let's look at dealing with missing values. So data isn't always available. There might be malfunctions with equipment, or it might have been deleted for some reason, or it might not have ever been considered important at the time of the data gathering. So we need to solve this missing data. So there's several approaches for doing that. The first and 
these these approaches we we might use them in different for different reasons. First off, we might just ignore the data point that has the missing that has missing values. The problem with that is that if we do that, we might not have any data left. So we often can't just ignore all the records that, with missing values. If we have a lot, quite a lot of data, then that's okay, or it might be a possibility, but generally it's not. Uh, the second approach is to fill in the missing values manually. So essentially, go through every record, look at what's the the missing values and work out what the correct value should be. Generally this is not an appropriate approach for a couple of reasons. First off, it's just way too time consuming. Our, our data sets have thousands and thousands of records so we just don't have the time or the interest to go through every single record and, and find those mistakes and, and fix them. Second off, there might be inconsistencies with the way that people do this. You want to generally want to do things properly. So you don't want to introduce more errors. So another approach might be to use some kind of global constant to fill in the missing values. So for example, if there's a missing value, we might just set it to zero if it's a number or, or the value unknown. Again, that's often not, I mean, if we can't do anything better, then maybe that's okay, but generally that's not a, an appropriate approach either. Um, if it's a numeric, attribute, then we might use the mean of the attribute. So we would look at the, for that one attribute, let's say age, we look at the average over all of the data points. So we find the average value for the age in our data set and we replace the, the missing values with that average value, with that average age. Again, it's not a great approach and the reason for that is that there might be we're trying to replace the missing value with something that makes sense for the data set and just replacing it with the average or the mean may cause more problems than it solves. It might not help us um, to, that, that value just might not be very predictive or, or not very useful. So having some data points where the, the age is correct and some data points where the age is the mean is going to confuse the prediction for the for the attributes that have an age that's near the mean. So generally this is not a great way of doing it. Um, it also doesn't work for categorical or nominal data. Um, another approach is to use the most probable value or to um, use the most frequent value. Again, and that will work with categorical, but it's not, again, it has similar kind of problems to using the mean. Uh, a better approach is to use the mean for all of the samples that are in that class. So let's, let's go with um, the example with age. So we're trying to fill in the missing values for age and maybe the classification that we have we're in the data set we're trying to predict whether someone takes up an advertising offer or not. So for the attribute values for the people that don't take up the offer, we would take the average of that and then fill in the missing values for those in those cases with that value and then for the people that did take up the offer we would fill, out, we would fill in the missing values with the average of the ages for the people that did that did take up the offer. So it's sort of like it's a slightly better prediction uh, than just using the average for all the data points. Again that, that's actually not a too bad an approach but it, it maybe isn't all that helpful. A better way is to try to predict the value for the missing value. And the way that we do that is to make a, in some, in some ways we make a new data set where the thing we're trying to predict is the missing value. And we use all of the data that where it's not missing as our training data. And then we try to predict the values for them. We, we learn a relationship between all of our data and that attribute. So all of the data and then predicting age for the cases where we know the age. And then we use that model to make the predictions where we don't know the value of the age. So we all we, we know all the other parts probably and then we just predict age and then fill those in. And that, that approach generally works quite nicely. Um, we'll see this a little bit in class maybe in a couple of weeks. Okay so that's dealing with missing values. Let's now look at smoothing out the noisy data. So with smoothing out the noisy data we're interested in getting rid of noise in the data set. 
And there's three main approaches to do this. The first one is called binning, the second one is called clustering, and the third one is called regression. So let's go through each of these in turn. So let's look at the first one of these. So smoothing out the noisy data using binning. So the idea is that we group a whole lot of values for the attribute together into one bin, and then we replace the values with some representative of the bin. And we can either replace it with the mean value of the bin, the average value of the bin, or we could replace it with either the boundaries of the bin, so the smaller value if it's closer to the smaller, or the larger value if it's closer to the larger. So this diagram, we'll see an example of this in a minute, but let's just looking at this diagram, um, which is admittedly a little bit confusing, but let's see how it works. So we've got some values for an attribute, and the values, and we've ordered all of the attribute values in increasing order. So the attribute values are 4, 8, 15, we've got two, two data points have the value 21, we've got a 24, a 25, a 28, and a 34. And we're trying to smooth the value of this attribute, but not, I mean we could choose one value, the average of that, but that's smoothed way too much. So the binning allows us to smooth it a little bit less. So we can put, let's say for example that we're going to we're going to bin our, we're going to use three bins. Now the number of bins that you use can differ uh, depending on what you're trying to do, depending on how much smoothing you want to use, but just for the sake of argument, we're going to use three bins. And we're going to put uh, three values in each bin. So because we had nine values, that means three values will go into each bin. So bin one is going to have the values 4, 8 and 15. And bin 2 will have the 221s and the 24. And bin 3 will have the remaining ones, which is the 25, the 28, and the 34. So now we've binned the values for that attribute into three bins, bin 1, bin 2, and bin 3. That means we can replace the values with some representative from each of those bins. So thinking about the mean, we would replace the values 4 or 8 or 15 with the mean of, of that bin. So because there's a 4 and an 8 and a 15 in bin 1, the mean of bin 1 is 9. So any of the so if our data point has the a value that's either that's in that bin 1, so it's either a 4 or an 8 or a 15, we're going to replace it with the bin mean, which is 9. So you can see that's why we have those three 9s. The 4 has been replaced with a 9, the 8's been replaced with the 9 and the 15 has been replaced with the 9. And the same thing happens with the other bins as well. So for example, the, the, the values that are, that are in the second bin, either the, the 221s or the 24, well those values will, will be replaced with the mean of that bin, which is 22. So that's why we have those three 22s. And the final bin, the three values that make up that final bin, get replaced with the the 25 would be replaced with the 29, which is the mean. The 28 would be replaced with the 29, which is the mean. And the 34 would be replaced with the mean, which is 29. 34 would be replaced with 29, which is the mean. So that's where those numbers come from. There's actually a really simple way to do it, and that is we get our data set in, you can do it in Excel really easily. We reorder the data points by the value in the increasing order of the the value for the attribute we're interested in smoothing. So it's really important that you don't sort just that column. You sort you sort all of the rows by that column. And then we just divide that up into three or four or five or however many bins make sense for the problem. And then we work out the mean and then we can just replace it quite easily. And we're going to have an exercise where, where you have a go at doing that. So that's replacing with the means. The other approach is, so that's actually um, smooth it out quite a lot. From the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 possible values for the 9 values we had, we've now gone down from those 8 down to 3 values, 9, 22, and 29. So that's a fairly radical smoothing. Generally that's going to be a bit too much. But if we don't want to smooth it quite so much, instead of replacing the value by the mean of the bin, we replace it by the boundary of the bin depending on how close it is. 
So, um, and that's what's happening in that that second um, sort of orangey coloured square. So if we go back to the bin 1, the value 4 would be replaced with the bin boundary 4 because that's the lower of the, the values in that bin. And the 15 would be replaced by the 15. The 8, because it's closer to the 4 than it is to the 15, we're going to replace it with the 4. And the same story with the second bin. Actually, there's no smoothing there at all. The 21 get is closer to 21 than 24, so it gets replaced with 21. And the 24, of course, is on the edge of the, the bin, so it gets replaced with um, 24. And bin 3, um, the 25 is the lower bound, so it gets replaced with 25. The 34 stays at 34. The 28 is closer to 25 than it is to 34, so it gets replaced with 25 rather than 34. Now, this is a really simple toy example where we only have three values in each bin. You wouldn't normally do this. This is just to show you how, how it works. Normally you would have many, many um, values in the bin and you would, and so the smoothing would be slightly different. Okay, let's look at the second approach to smoothing out our noisy data, and that's clustering. So here we have um, each of these circles in the, in this, in the red rectangle are data points according to some x and according to some y. And what we're going to do, all of the data points that are in that first cluster, so the red ones, we're going to replace with the cluster representative. So the values of x and the y for any of the data points that are in that red one would be replaced with the x and y value for the plus that's at the center of that cluster. And the same with the green cluster. Any of the data points that have values with x's and y's that are in that cluster would be replaced with the plus, which is the, the cluster um, centroid in, um, in the green cluster. Same with the gray. The blue ones are sort of outliers, so we wouldn't really want to replace those with the closest, with one of the pluses. We'd maybe keep it with the same value. Okay, so let's look at the third approach. Here we're going to use regression to replace values. So here we're going to replace each data value with the regressed value. So what this graph is showing, so we've got a whole lot of, we've got our data points um, on our x and our y, and um, the actual values of the, the actual value is the x, and we want to replace it with the y. So um, we have a y value that it is, but we've, we've, we've regressed a line so we've worked out a line that sort of fits those data points and we're going to replace the, for a particular x1 value, we're going to replace it not with the actual value but with the value it is on that line. So again, it's smoothing the data points. Instead of them being sort of bumpy around that line, they're now going to be fitted to that line. Okay, let's have a look at um, the binning in a little bit more detail. So the binning methods don't necessarily capture the meaning of the interval data. So we saw earlier where we, we chose either the mean of the bin or the um, bin edges, bin boundaries. It's hard to know where to draw those bin boundaries. We just chose three, for example, but that may not really make sense. So um, it might be better to use distance-based partitioning to give better um, kinds of bins. So let's look at how that can work. There's two main approaches. There's equi-width binning and there's equi-depth binning. And we're just going to go through some, some examples, uh, an example of each of those. To start off, let's have a look at the attribute that we're trying to bin. So in this case, it's the price. And we've ordered our data points in order of the price. In fact, there's only the price attribute, which doesn't make sense in reality, but we would usually have more data, but we're just going to look at just the price. So we've got six different price values, or six different data points with price values. We've got a 7, a 20, a 22, a 50, a 51, and a 53. And we're going to work out bins that make sense for this data. So first off, let's look at equi-width binning. So the idea here is that we have each bin is going to have an equal width in terms of price, dollars. So 
we've chosen, for example, just ten dollars here. And again, this is just arbitrary. It's, I've just pulled that out of the air, but it would, in some sense, this might make sense. You can think of age. You might want to do it in in um, ten years or I don't know five year breaks or, or whatever. It depends on how many data points you've got and um, and what and what um, sort of granularity you want. Anyway, for the sake of argument, let's break our bins into ten dollar widths. So each bin has the an equal width. That's why it's called equi width. So we're going to choose zero to ten dollars, and then the next bin will take eleven to twenty dollars. Next one will take twenty one to thirty dollars, forty one to fifty dollars, and the last one will take fifty one to sixty dollars. And what I've shown here is I've replaced we would replace the seven with the bin name, which is called discretization. So the bin name in this case is uh, zero to ten. Or we might take our bin mean, or we might take our bin boundary, like we did um, previously. For the for the time being, let's just use the bin name, which is just that brackets square bracket zero to ten, close square brackets. So it's called discretization in that case. It's called discretization because we're, um, we're changing from a numeric to discrete. We're making, it's, it's in, in effect, we're changing from a, a numeric attribute to a categorical attribute. The categorical attribute is the name, 0 to 10. So the 7, because it is in the bin 0 to 10, it gets replaced with the name 0 to 10. The 20, because it's in the bin 11 to 20, it gets replaced with 11 to 20. You can see the 22 becomes 21 to 30, 50 becomes 41 to 50, and the 51 and the 53 both become 51 to 60. Again, this is a really contrived and simple example. We've only got six data points that are spread over this large region. But when you have a lot more data points, um, you get many more data points in each bin. But in this case, we've just sort of got one in the first four bins and two in the second bin. So that's equi width binning. So the, the, the each in ten dollars. So ten minus zero is ten dollars. Twenty minus eleven is ten dollars. Thirty minus twenty one is ten dollars, and so on. So that's our first kind of binning. The other type of binning is equi depth binning. So with equi depth binning, the bins have the same number of values in them. So we don't really care about where they start and where they end. We just want to make sure that every single one of the bins, and we've got three bins in this case, are going to have two data points in them. So remember we had six data points, the 7, the 20, the 22, 50, 51, and 53. So we've got, so we've got six data points, and we want each bin to have two data points in it. So six divided by two is three, so we need three bins. So the first bin is going to have the first two data points in it, so the 7 and the 20. So we're going to replace the 7 with the 720 bin and the 20 with the 720 bin. The second bin is going to have the 22 and the 50 in it, so it's going to so the 22 gets replaced with the 22 to 50 bin and the 50 gets replaced with the 22 to 50 bin. And then same for the last bin. So the last bin is going to have the 51 and the 53 in it, so we replace the 51 with the 5153 bin, the 53 with the 51 to 53 bin. You can't always get the same number of data points in each bin. Sometimes it just doesn't work. So we try to keep as as good as possible the number of data points in each bin. So how do we know how many bins and how many to use in it, how many to put in each bin? Well, again, it depends on what we want to do with the data. If we're trying to visualize it, if we want lots and lots of smoothing, then we're going to choose a smaller number of bins. But if we don't want quite so much smoothing, which is usually what we want to do, then we might have more bins. Ideally, we, we're not going to want to have the same number of bins as data points because then there's no point in doing the smoothing at all, or the binning at all. OK, so um, we've chosen 7 and 20 because they're the lower and higher bins prices. But we could also use. Um, 1 to 20, 21 to 50, or 51 to 60, and then 
the reason for doing that is that um, when we get new points, so we we have a seven, but let's say we got a six. Well, with a six and we had our bin of seven to twenty, we wouldn't know where to put that six data, the six price point. But if our bin was one one to twenty, then we would know to put that six data point, the six price into the first bin. So generally, you want to stretch your bins out so that um, the bin boundaries out so that they allow new data to be put in. Okay, so that's our binning. Let's now look at data integration. So generally with data analytics, we want to um, combine data, or well, often with data analytics, we want to combine data from different sources into some common data store. So there's several challenges with integrating data. The first is schema integration. So here we just need to make sure that the that for example CID means the same thing in, in one data set as C underscore number, so customer number in another data set, which means which is the same as cust ID in a third data set, which is the same as cust hash or customer number in the fourth data set. So we're just trying to make sure that the names match up so that we're talking about the same thing. Uh, the second is semantic heterogeneity. That means that the meaning is different between um, different attribute values. So we just need to make sure that when we're merging attributes, they have the same meaning in the different data sets. Otherwise, we introduce errors into the data. There may be data value conflicts. So for example, the data might be represented in different scales or in different ways. Um, for example, um, prices might be represented in Australian dollars or US dollars. So if we just take the number on its own and don't care about what the what it's measured in, then it's not going to make sense. Uh, and the fourth thing is uh, the fourth challenge is synchronization. So sometimes we need our data to be in particular time sequence. So if we don't merge things properly, then the, then there's issues. And we often use metadata, so data that's associated with the, with the attribute names, to do a proper data integration. And this comes into it doing that data audit that we talked about last week. Okay, let's now look at redundant attributes. So with redundant attributes, we're interested in attributes that can be derived from other ones. So the a common example here, it's not on the slide, but a common example here is the price of a product and the GST on the product. So because GST is one-tenth of the price, then the two things are talking about the, uh, essentially they're correlated there. They can be one can be derived from the other. The example on the slide, body mass index, can be is computed from the mass in kilos divided by the height in meters. So if we have body mass index and mass both in the data set together, then they're going to be correlated, they're going to be redundant. We only need one of them. So correlation analysis helps us find these redundancies. Um, so what the rest of the slide is trying to show, if we have A is one attribute and B is another attribute, then we can look at the probability of observing A and the probability of observing B. So if A and B, those two attribute value, attributes are independent, then the, prob the joint probability, so the probability of observing A and B, is equal to the probability of observing A times the probability of observing B. If they're not independent, that's, then that's not the case. So there's a way of doing correlation analysis where if we, if we can compute the probability of A and B happening and then divide it by the, by the product of probability A on its own times probability B on its own, if that fraction is 1, then that means they're independent. If it's greater than one, they're positively correlated. If they're if it's less than one, then they're negatively correlated. And we'll go through an example because that's somewhat confusing. Other ways, there, there are other ways to compute correlation between um, attributes, things like Pearson correlation, or this, there's even other ones, Spearman correlation and Kendall correlation. Generally, people use Pearson correlation. And you, you'll probably remember You'll probably remember that from your statistics um, classes. So let's look at an example using this probability approach. So here, just to, to remind you, the correlation analysis on the end, if it's equal to 1, they're independent. 
If it's positive, if it's more than one, the positive correlation. If it's less than one, it's negatively correlated. By the way, positive correlation means that as one increases, the other one increases. As A increases, B increases. And negative means as A increases, B decreases. So an example of positive correlation would be the GST and the price. As the price increases, the GST increases. And negative correlation, uh, an example of that is as... Well, it's a, it's a bit of a crappy example. As, an, as the number of drinks that you consume increases, the amount of lucidity decreases, if you could measure, measure lucidity in some way. It's a crappy example, sorry. Okay, let's look at um, how we can measure this A, probability of A and B, and the, a and, the, and the probability of A and probability of B. So look at this funny little table in the middle on the left-hand side. So it's a bit... It's a little bit weird. So we've got um, three attributes. We've got the x attribute, the y attribute, and the z attribute. And sorry, the attributes are along other rows, which is a little bit different to the way that we usually show it. So we've got these three attributes, x and y and z. And they're binary. So it's either a 0 or a 1. So if, And then each of the columns is one example in the data set. So example 1... Um, x is 1, y is 1, but z 0. Uh, in the second example, they're all 1. So we can look at item sets. So here we have, for example, the item set of x and y. So we can work out a correlation between that. So what's the, what's the number of examples? So we've got 8 data points. So how many of those examples are, is x 1 and y 1? So that's that probability of A and B. So the number of examples where X is 1 and Y is 1 are 2 out of those 8. Because the first two, the first two columns, X1, X, X is 1 and Y is 1. But after that, it's not the case that X is 1 and Y is 1. So it's 2 out of those 8. So the 2 out of the 8 is uh, 1 quarter, so that's where that um, support comes from. Uh, and the probability of A, so we have four X's out of that are one out of out of eight of them. So that's where that four out of eight comes from. And the the two out of eight is the number of Y's. So we have two Y's that are one di divided by eight in total. So th the number of cases where X is one and Y is one is two out of eight divided by the number of cases where X is one. 4 out of 8 times the number of cases where y, where y is 1, which is 2 out of 8. So 2 out of 8 divided by 4 out of 8 times 2 out of 8 will give a correlation of 2. It, it's um, positive, it's greater than 1, so it's a positive correlation. The support is just talking about how many times we see it in the data set. So for example, x and y... So two out of the eight data sets, out of the eight data points, X is one and Y is one, so it's two out of eight, and that's where we're getting that 25%. Okay, that was a bit complicated. Let's um, move now from the correlation analysis to normalization. So here we're interested in normalization. Normalization works on numeric attributes. And what we're gonna do is change the so the attributes are in some particular range so some range of values we want to represent them in another range so typically you would um, you would change the range to be between minus one and plus one or zero and one and the reason for doing this is that all things um, considered you want attributes to count equally so some data mining algorithms, things, particularly things like neural networks, if you have a value in some large range, so let's say salary, where it's in hundreds of thousands of dollars, compared to another attribute, maybe um, age, which would be an age of a person, which would be you know, up to 120 or so, because the values that are in the hundreds of thousands are much bigger than the values that are uh, than the age, 
the data mining algorithm, which just doesn't understand the what the tool is doing, it doesn't understand what the meaning of the data is, it's going to think that the numbers that are bigger are more important. So typically with a neural network, for example, we need to normalize our data so that um, all of the numeric attributes have a similar range between 0 and 1 or minus 1 to plus 1. And, the, and so then it will consider each of the attributes as being equally important. So, let's, so there's several different ways of doing this and some of them might introduce distortions or biases into the data but sometimes you don't mind that, so sometimes you want that to happen. So we need to understand the different properties and the weaknesses, or the potential weaknesses of the methods before we use it. So let's look at a couple. The first one we're going to look at is called min-max normalization. So min-max normalization is transforming our data from a data attribute A to be a new attribute, attribute A prime, and it's just a linear transformation. So the formula for it is on the next line. So min and max are the old, are the min, minimum value and the maximum value in A in the old, in the old scale, and new min and new max are the new minimum and the new maximum that you want to be in the A prime scale. So um, what we're going to do is um, this A minus min divided by max minus min just transforms the, the, the A value to being a value between 0 and 1. New ma then multiplying it by new max minus new min scales it into the new range that we're interested in but it's still starting from zero, and then we add new min to it so that the zero value becomes new min instead of zero. If you draw it out on a number line, which we would if I had a whiteboard, you, you can see how this works. So as an example, we might want to transform um, a salary, 30,000, or A is 30,000, from a range that was 10,000 to 45,000, so new, so min is 10,000, and max is 45,000 into a new scale, 0 to 1, where new min is 0 and new max is 1. So we just plug it into the formula. So A is 30,000, we subtract min, which is 10,000, divide by the 45,000 minus 10,000, which is the min, max minus min, multiply by 1 minus 0, which is the new max minus the new min, and add on what new min is, so that's 0, and we get 0.57. So 30,000, which is about 57% of the way through the 10,000 to 45,000 range, becomes 0.57. So min-max normalization preserves all the relationships of the data values um, exactly. So if A has the value min, then it will become, then, then A prime will have the value new min. And if A has the value max, then A prime will have the value new max. And if A is halfway between min and max, then A prime will become halfway between new min and new max. So it's totally linear. There's no bias anymore. The problem is, if, we, if you don't know what your min and the max are, or if you don't know what the new min or the new max is, then you can't do the normalization properly. So for example, in the example we have here, we've got um, A's, but we've said it's between 10,000 and 45,000. Well, if we were looking at our data and then suddenly in a, in our, in a new piece of data, we get the value $5,000, then what value, should it, what, sh what value should it have in the new scale? Doesn't, <laughs> should it be zero or should it be less than zero? There's no, it's an out-of-bounds error, so we don't really know how to deal with that. So there's several ways of dealing with that. First off, we could ignore that the range has been exceeded, but that's going to affect the model. We could just ignore any of the data points that are out of the range. Pro there's, a there's two big problems with this. First is that it reduces the our confidence that the original sample of, of min to max 
represented the population. And the other problem is that it introduces a bias. If we remove the out-of-range values and they had a particular pattern, then if we ignore them, then um, we're ignoring part of the problem. Uh, the other approach is to clip the outer range values. So if the value is greater than 1, we assign 1. If it's less than 0, we'd set to 0. So if the value that we, was less than min, we would set it to min. And if it was greater than max, we'd set it to max. The problem with this is that we're making an assumption. We're assuming that the out of range values are equivalent to the range limits. And that may not be the case at all, and it might actually make the problem more difficult. So there's no real easy way to solve these, um, these problems. So I'd suggest that min-max normalization is only useful if you really do know the proper range um, of your data. Uh, the other, another approach is using uh, z-score normalization. With z-score normalization, we're going to use the mean and the standard deviation of the attribute A. And what we're going to do we're going to change the data so that it's um, centered on the mean and it has a standard deviation of 1. Now this assumes that your data is normally distributed, which may not be the case, so you may be introducing some bias then. But it deals with the problems where we don't know the actual minimum or the actual maximum of the, of the data. So what we're going to do, if we have our new attribute a prime, that's going, we get that from a by subtracting the mean. So the mean is the mean of attribute a. And that means that a minus the mean means that the attribute, an attribute that's at the mean gets a value 0, so it centers, and an attribute less than the mean gets a negative value, and an attribute more than the mean gets a positive value. So it's moving the data around the origin. The second thing we do is divide it by the standard deviation of A, and that just um, pulls it in. So it means that the variance changes from maybe being very wide or very narrow to being 1. So it's a fairly standard technique. Another approach that we can use is, not, is decimal scaling. So this is a bit of a funny one. All we're doing is dividing it by 10 to the power of something so that the the range of A moves into being between 0 and 1, or the absolute value of it moves between 0 and 1. So as an example, if we have an attribute, if, the, if it ranges between minus 98 and 9,738, then if we use J equals 4, so it's 10,000, then that means that A ranges between 0 0.0098 and 0 0.9738. Because the absolute value of that is the, the maximum there is 0.9738 and it's less than it's between 0 and 1 then we've then we're okay. Okay now I want to talk about a couple of normalization techniques that are nonlinear and that that solves a, an interesting kind of problem. The first of these is softmax. <clears throat> so it's called softmax because um, it it reaches towards its maximum and minimum values softly, but it never really gets it gets there. So it uses an asymptote, and the output is between zero and one. You can't get values that are that are less than zero or greater than one. And there's also a sort of a linear part of the range, and we can control that based on uh, a parameter. So the linear parts described in how many um, normally distributed standard deviations have that linear response. So what we do is our A prime, our new value of the attribute, is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus at, and the at is the attribute value minus its mean divided by some lambda times the standard deviation divided by 2 pi. That lambda is the um, is that um, the linear part. It makes more sense if you can see what the what the graph of 1 on 1 plus e to the minus at looks like. It looks like this. So you can see um, along the x is the a and along the y is the a prime. So 
any A that has um, a high positive value becomes closer and closer to 1, becomes normalized closer and closer to 1, but it never ever reaches 1 because it's an asymptote. And any values that are large, large negative, after they've been through this mean divided by standard deviation, anything that's large negative is going to um, reach towards zero but never get there. And values that are at the mean um, become zero. And you can see that lambda controls the slope of the red line um, at sort of towards that middle part. This solves a really good problem when you have outliers. So for example, let's say you have salary. And you know a minimum, you may not know a minimum value of the salary, zero, but there may be no maximum salary. It just gets larger and larger and larger. So um, if we use softmax normalization, then we can handle the really large um, incomes or large salaries. They just become closer and closer to one, but they never get there. So it deals with the cases where you don't know the range or where it really exceed, it gets very, very large or very, very, very small or very negative. There's another, um, so that's softmax, it goes between 0 and 1. There's another approach called sigmoid normalization. And sigmoid normalization, it, it's a little bit similar. It's, uh, it's also a nonlinear one, but it maps between minus 1 and plus 1. Again, we're going to use the, the mean and the standard deviation. And then we're going to, but instead of doing 1 over 1 plus 1 plus e to the minus at, we're going to go 1 minus e to the minus v divided by 1 plus e to the minus v. And that v is just the attribute value minus its mean divided by the standard deviation. Again, values that are close to the mean are mapped to the linear bit in the middle, and the outliers um, are pushed to either plus or minus 1, depending on if they're positive or negative. And again, it deals really well when we have these um, outliers. So it makes more sense when you can see what it looks like. So this is a, a um, graph of the 1 on 1 plus e to the minus v, 1 minus e to the minus v over 1 plus e to the minus v. And you can see it's similar to the softmax except that it um, hits either 1 or minus 1. It just depends on how you want to normalize your data. Okay, that's it for normalization. And we're going to do some exercises uh, in class on that. Let's now look at data reduction. So often data is um, too large to use and we need to reduce the amount of data to improve the performance of our algorithms. And what we essentially want, want to do is reduce the representation of the data set but still produce the same results. We sort of want to get rid of the data that's not important. And there's different approaches. So data reduction can talk about aggregation or dimensionality reduction, which is quite a large field. There's discretization. Numerosity reduction is about is about reducing the number of data points. The other ones above were to do with getting rid of the number of attributes. Let's have a look at the first one, aggregation. So here we have a cube. So we have we might have sales volume as a function of the product, which is uh, along the edge the month along the bottom and the region along the depth. So we've got product, location and region and time. Uh, and we can hierarchically summarize the data. So we could summarize by industry, then category, then product, or region, country, city, office, or year, quarter, month, day, or year, week, day. So by doing these kinds of um, summarizations, we can reduce the amount of data. Essentially, we're summing it. Here's an example. Here we've got sales of televisions in Australia, and we've got um, um, along the date we've got the the sales by each quarter, and then the sum. We've got the sales by the product, so we've got TVs, PCs, VCRs, and then in the front the sum, and then we've got um, we've got the by the country, so we've got Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and then the sum. So we can look at each of those cells, say the blue cell at the bottom, and that gives us our total annual sales of um, all products over the year in overall countries. 
So we can do an aggregation to reduce the data to a concept level that we need to do the data. Um, so the picture at the bottom shows um, we've got several locations and where, um, and then we've got more locations at the bottom. We've got years. We've got more categories. So you can see we can sort of break it up in different ways. This is a kind of thing that OLAP does quite a lot, uh, and you can also do it using um, pivot tables in Excel. So it's it's a good way to, uh, if you know the query that you're interested in, often this kind of data is what we feed into the data mining. So let's look at the next one, which is dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction, it's also called feature selection or feature subset selection or attribute subset selection. Here we're interested in choosing a smaller number of attributes, so reducing the number of attributes in our data set. And we want to select only the most important or the necessary attributes. So we're trying to find the minimum set of attributes so that the probability distribution of the data classes is as close as possible to the original data. I'm just going to show one example here, and that's decision tree induction. So you can see um, our original attribute set is in the top left. So we have five attributes, which are imaginatively called A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. And we've got two classes, class one and class two. And if we build a decision tree, we can see that we need A1, A3, and A5 to make a prediction between class one and class two. So we don't actually need A2 and A4. They're not important to make that classification. So if they're not important, we can just get rid of them. We can reduce the attribute set by re removing those attributes. So that's sort of a feeling for how it works. There's quite a lot of attribute of feature subset selection methods, um, and they break down into several kinds. The first is brute force approach. So here we're trying to try all the possible feature subsets and then choose the one that gives the best result. The problem with this is that it doesn't scale with the number of attributes very well. So because of that, we can't generally use brute force approach, so we need to use some kind of heuristic approach. And depending on which heuristic you use, which rule of thumb you use, you get different kinds of approaches. So, and they can divide into three kinds. First is embedded approaches. Here we, the feature selection happens naturally as part of the data mining algorithm that we're using. So if we're using, if we're trying to do a classification, then um, if we're using something like a decision tree or a method called random forest, which we'll see later in, this, in the session, well, those methods already do the feature selection as part of building the, the classification model. So they're embedded. The feature selection is embedded in the classification task itself. So that's the first kind. The second approach is filter approaches. Here we look at all the features before we run the data mining algorithm and we apply usually some rule to each feature. We rank them and then we just choose the most important ones. Often we'll be, um, often filter approaches are used when you have very, very many attributes. So for example, the, the gene expression data that I use in my research, we have um, 20,000 attributes at least. So we can't, often there's no real way to easily deal with those number of attributes, so we have to treat them independently. We have to assume that they don't, um, they're don't; independent of one another. And we can apply, and so filter approaches do that, and apply something like the Bayes information criterion or info gain to choose, to rank the attributes and then to choose them. And the final approach is wrapper approaches. Here we use a data mining algorithm as a black box to find the best subset and then after we've done that, we, we use those attributes in our classification problem. So it's different to the embedded. The embedded, the feature selection is happening naturally as part of the data mining algorithm. With wrapper, we use some kind of data mining algorithm to find the subset. And then after we've got that subset, then we, then we do our classification or whatever. So there's several kinds of criteria that we can use in the filter approaches. We can... Um, look at redundant features, so uh, for example if we have purchase price of a product and the amount of GST paid, because they're redundant, we can just choose one of those attributes. 
Or we might do the other way around. We might look at irrelevant features. So there may be some attributes that have nothing to do. They're not correlated with what we're trying to do, the classification. So um, in that case, we can throw them away. So an example here might be student IDs. So student IDs might not be relevant to predict the um, grade point average of a student. Name often isn't. So if it's not relevant, we just throw it away. It's irrelevant. Okay, so those are our attributes. Um, let's look now about reducing the number of data points. So here um, we're doing something called numerosity reduction. So we're trying to reduce the number of data points, not the number of attributes. And there's several approaches here. We could do histogramming and to divide the data into buckets and then just store some representation of the buckets. We do a similar kind of thing with the clustering. So You've seen this clustering diagram before. We've got a whole lot of red data points, so we we get rid of all the red data points and just use the, the, the value of the plus in the middle, and same for the other ones. Or we can just sample, take some sample set of the, um, of the attributes. Typically, it doesn't work very well to do random sampling. Usually, you want to do something called stratified sampling. So you can stratify the sampling based on the class that you're interested in, and then you make sure that you've got a similar number from each class. Let's look a little bit about sampling now, because it's a fairly important topic in data mining. So sampling is the main technique that we use when we select data. And it's often used um, in a preliminary investigation when you're just trying to get um, explore the data. And um, so statisticians sample because uh, obtaining the entire set of data is maybe too expensive or time consuming. Sampling in data analytics is used because processing the entire data set is, is too expensive. So the key thing that we're interested in when we do sampling is to use a sample that works almost as well as using the entire data set. So we want a representative data set. So it's representative if it has approximately the same property as a mixture as the original set of data. So there's several types of sampling that we can do. Simple random sampling, we just assume that there's an equal probability of selecting any of the any of the data points. Uh, we can do something called sampling without replacement. So that means we take, so we've got a big data set and we're trying to create a sample, a smaller set of it. So if it's random sampling, we just each data point has um, an equal probability of being chosen. We're sampling without replacement means that as we choose a data point, we remove it from the population so it can't be chosen twice. Another approach is sampling with replacement. And what we do here is we can choose the same data point twice. So each of the data points probably has the same probability of being chosen. We, um, and we, go, we go through making a sample, we choose a data point, if we don't take it out of the population, we leave it there. So it means that it can be chosen more than once. That sounds like a really mad thing to do. But there's, um, there's really important reasons for doing it. It's called bootstrap sampling. And we'll see why we might want to do that a bit later, particularly when we get up to the random forests later. It's a very, very important technique. Stratified sampling. Here we're just trying to split the data into different partitions. Then we draw a random sample from each partition. So let's say we're trying to do fraud detection. So with fraud detection, generally there's not very many examples of fraud, but there's many examples of not fraud. So if we were just to do a random sample of that data set, we're probably going to get a data set that is, is all non-fraud. But usually in that situation we're trying to predict fraud, not predict not fraud. So in those kind of situations we often want to do a stratified sampling. So we'll We'll split the population into two parts: the fraudulent part and the. Um, sorry, I had to do a cough there. Uh, so stratified sampling, we're trying to split into several partitions. So we've got our fraud and our non-fraud. So we split our population into the fraudulent part and the non-fraudulent part, and then we do a random sample from each of those separately, and then plonk them together in our sample. And the benefit of doing that is we get roughly number the similar number of. Um, fraudulent and non-fraudulent, and we can build a better classifier. So we might see an example of that later. Uh, the sample size that we use is important because we might or might not be able to see the patterns in there. This is just to 
simple example where we have 8,000 data points, 2,000 data points, and 500, and you can see that um, the pattern isn't quite as clear in each, in each one. The next kind of data preprocessing we're going to look at is discretization. With discretization, we're trying to um, ch essentially change a numeric variable or attribute into a discrete attribute. Um, so we might be trying to change numeric age into a categorical age. So usually we do that by dividing the range of attributes into intervals. So we've already done that, that's called binning. So we do binning and then we replace the bin label with an interval label. So for example, we might um, say that anyone's age of uh, 19, 0 to 19 is teenager or young. Uh, so the reason we need to do this is because some data mining algorithms can't use numeric data. They can only use nominal or categorical attributes. So for example, um, very early kinds of decision trees, we'll look at ID3 in a few weeks, it can't handle numeric data. And association rule, mine, rule mining, it can't handle numeric data either. Generally though, most, most of the time, um, data mining algorithms can use numeric data now. And sometimes we want to go the other way. So here we might want to change a nominal attribute or a categorical attribute into a numeric attribute. And the reason we want to do this is because some, sometimes some data mining algorithms can't deal with nominal, da nominal attributes. So a good example of this are neural networks or, or um, support vector machines. So neural networks cannot deal with data that is not numeric. So we need to code the the categorical attributes as numeric. And there's various ways of doing that, but let's just look at one example, and it's called binarization. Now, you'll need to be doing this in the second assignment, so you'll need to come back to this slide in the second assignment. So that's a bit of a hint to those people who are li actually listening to the lectures. So what we're going to do is recode Outlook into, into a binary, so binarize the Outlook attribute. So you can see Outlook can take three different values. It can either be overcast or it can be rainy or it can be sunny. So what we do is from that one Outlook attribute we make three new attributes. One called Outlook is overcast, one called Outlook is rain and the other one called Outlook is sunny. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner you can see the pale yellow um, attributes. There's three attributes there now instead of one. And essentially what we do is the first data point in our data set is sunny. So the outlook is sunny. So we recode the outlook overcast is zero, the outlook rain is zero, and the outlook sunny as one. And the second record is also sunny, so it's the same. The third record is overcast, so we set overcast to one and then rain and sunny to zero. So it's quite quite simple. And we can do that with Windy and whether we play tennis or not as well. So it's binarization. Now, generally we don't want to use all of our data set to build our models. We need to do something a bit tricky. What we do is we generally split the data set into three parts. Most of the data we use for a training set. Then we have two other small parts of the data set. One is cross-validation set or validation set and the other one is called the test set. And we use the data in different ways so that we can check that our, that our model that we're building is correct. We're going to see this um, throughout the semester. So most of the data set is used to, build the to train the model, so maybe 70% is often what people use. And the picture on the right hand side looks like we've just split, like the first 70% of the data we're using is training, the next 15 is cross, and the next 15 is test. You wouldn't normally do that, you'd use you'd sample it randomly because you don't want to introduce some kind of bias by, uh, by using the data audit. So we, we select 70% as the training set, and this is the data that's used to build the initial model. The next part is called the cross-validation set, and this is the data that we're going to use 
to work out the correct values of our of our model. So normally when we build a model, we need to set some parameters with it. And we don't know what the right parameters should be. So we use the cross-validation set to set that, those parameters in the, in the model, either to work out when to stop training or to, um, to set the parameters. And we'll see an example of this um, next week, I think, or the week after. So the purpose of using the cross-validation set is to prevent something called overtraining. Overtraining means that we've we've got a model that that um, produces really good results for the training set, but when we were to show that model in the wild to new data, it doesn't do very well at all. So we definitely don't want a model that does that. So we can use the cross validation set to help us do that. The test set is a separate set of data that's never that the model's never seen. And we're going to use that to evaluate the model performance. So we, we build our model with the training set. We work out when to stop training with the cross-validation set. Now we've got our lovely model. And now we test the model on the test set. So we, we run the model on the test set and then compare the results that the model gives with the, with the true answers that we know from the test set. And we can see an accuracy or the error of, on that. And then because the test set hasn't ever been used by the the model, it's almost like getting data from the real world. So this is a very typical approach to training models, and we'll see this later. So just to go in a little bit more detail with each of uh, these data sets, the training set, um, the most important thing we need to do here is we need to make sure that the training set covers the full range of experiences that the model is, is expected to see. Um, Usually, sometimes we need to oversample the rare cases so that the model can deal well. So this is often seen with fraud detection or with training a model to predict something like cancer or some kind of thing where there's not many examples of it compared to the other case. And we'll probably see this a little bit later. So the cross-validation and the test sets are used in these other ways. Cross-validation set, as we said, is used to stop the model from overtraining or overfitting. And the test set is used to evaluate the final performance of the model. Sometimes you don't have enough data to split it into these three um, sets. So there's two approaches that we can use there. The first is called K-fold cross-validation and the second is called bootstrap validation and we'll see each of these. The first one is k-fold cross-validation. This is a very very common approach. It's usually called tenfold cross-validation because we use k equals ten. So I'm just going to show it with k equals four because it's a bit easier to show. So what we do is we randomly divide the data into, into k-folds um, and each one has about the same number of records. So you can see we have fold one, fold two, fold three, and fold four. So we don't have to worry about training sets, test sets, and, and validation sets here. We just split all of our data into these four folds. And the idea is we build k models, k different models, and then evaluate them with some of the data. So for example, we, we hold back fold one to test our model one and then we use fold two, fold three and fold four as the training data to build the model and then we test it, the accuracy on fold one. So we've got one accuracy. Then we hold back fold two for testing and we train a new model using fold one, fold three and fold four data put together as the training set. We evaluate them on fold two and then we've got a, a um, accuracy. Then we do the same thing for fold three. Hold fold three back train the model using fold 1, fold 2 and fold 4 and then evaluate on fold 3 and we've got an accuracy and then lastly we hold fold 4 back and train a model on fold 1, 2 and 3 and then test it on fold 4. So now we've got four estimates of the test accuracy we just average those and then we can say that that's what we think the model would, would do. And then finally we put together all of the folds, so fold 1, 2, 3 and 4, all of that data together. We use that to train our model and then we say that the average of the accuracies that we worked out before is our best estimate of how of the accuracy of that model. So it's a way of using all of our data 
to build the model, but to still get an estimate of the accuracy. So this uh, uh, this page here just really essentially says what I just told you, the, the algorithm for doing it. The other approach to validating our models when we don't have much data is to use something called bootstrap validation. So the idea here is we build um, a new data set using um, sampling from the training set, but we do a sampling where we can um, choose the same data point more than once. So it's a bootstrap sample or sampling with replacement that we talked about earlier today. And um, the idea is that when you do that, you get roughly 63% um, of the data. So there'll be some data points that aren't actually used in, the, in that training set. And then you can use those to, to hold back as a, to estimate the accuracy of the training, of, of the model that you've built. So it's called bootstrap validation. Um, it's something that we, we use in random forests, so we'll see it again when we, when we get to that. Okay, well that's it for this um, today's lecture, and I'll see you um, for next week's lecture. Bye-bye.